So welcome to IPOPI webinar. Thank you all to share this moment with us. I am Martin Perjean, president of IPOPI, and it is my pleasure to moderate this webinar. This webinar has been made possible thanks to a donation from Susan Baron, who I sincerely thank. The theme today is the essentials of PID diagnostics. We will address the range of most essential tools and facilities that should be in place in all countries in order to make PID diagnosis. Then we will explore some recent developments made in PID diagnostics and how we can benefit from them. To address this theme, we have here with us today a great specialist, Dr. Kathleen Sullivan from Children's Hospital Philadelphia, USA. Dr. Sullivan is a friend of IPOPI and has been supporting us in our efforts to provide better global access to diagnostic tests. How will it work? Dr. Sullivan will give her talk. During the talk, you will be able to send written questions in the question tab that you can see on the right side of your webinar screen. So please ask all your questions. After the talk, we will discuss some of the questions with, this, uh, with Dr. Sullivan. Dr. Niza Malawi from Nika Hospital Paris and chair of IPOPI Medical Advisory Panel is also here today to take some of your questions in written. Thank you for that, Dr. Malawi. Dr. Sullivan, we are honored to hear your lecture today and the floor is yours. Thank you. Martin, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And indeed, it's my honor to be um, giving this talk today and to be able to help IPOPI, who has helped so many people around the world. I am going to start my talk about diagnostics by talking about the definition of immunodeficiencies, which might seem like a strange way to start off. <clears throat> but I mean to do this on purpose. So the first definition that you see on the screen is my definition, and it talks about absence or dysfunction of a cell or a biochemical pathway. You might think that's a little bit uh, arcane and not that easy to wrap your head around. IPOPI has a very similar definition, I was pleased to see. And the reason that we all struggle with the definition is because we are trying to ensure that people don't think of primary immunodeficiencies as just susceptibility to infection. There's more to the picture. And so I wanted to try and operationalize this and make it a little more concrete for people so that when you see patients in these categories, you sort of know how to move forward diagnostically. So this is my approach as a clinician. So the infections, I think people feel very comfortable with. If you have a patient with too many infections or the infections are too severe or they're very unusual infections. I think we all feel comfortable that that's a sign of immunodeficiency. But today we also think about people who have unusual autoimmunity. So this wouldn't be an adult with typical rheumatoid arthritis. This would be someone who has multiple organs involved and it doesn't even follow a classic pattern. It's not really lupus. It's not really mixed connective tissue disease. It's a lot of different organs. Those are people who typically deserve an immunologic evaluation. And in this category, I would also say people who have an unusually early age of onset. So I might not work up an adult with lupus, but I would certainly work up a child who has their onset at less than five years of age. So you have to think about age appropriateness of the autoimmune disease as well. And then the last category that I think we're all still grappling with in terms of who should be worked up are folks with very unusual ATP and folks with unusual inflammation, something like a periodic fever syndrome. So this is kind of my real life description of who I think should be worked up for an immune deficiency. And with that as kind of our background, I'm gonna move on and talk about diagnostics the way this talk is structured is I'm going to start with really um, widely available diagnostic tests and move towards the ones that are more high tech, less available, more expensive. And then at the end, I'm going to leave you with some resources. And maybe that's the most valuable thing that I do today 
I want to leave you with something. We all get stuck when we're trying to diagnose a patient. Every single person does. And so at the end, I'll leave you with some resources so at least you have some ways to move forward with a patient. So I'm going to start by just reminding you that immunodeficiencies, if you just have to guess what the problem is, statistically, it's more likely to be an antibody problem than anything else. And so I'm actually going to start by talking about antibodies and simple tests to look at immunodeficiency. And I think this makes sense. If you look at the pie chart on the right, that's the distribution of different types of immunodeficiencies in adults, you can see antibody in blue is the largest category of immunodeficiency in adults. It's still true in children, but there's a lot more diversity. That's the left-hand pie chart that you see there. And so these are data taken from USIDNet, but ESID has roughly the same data. I just wanted to make the point that there's more diversity in children. You have to be a little bit more thoughtful with the little kids than the adults, but always antibody is the most common. So as I said, I'm gonna start with lab tests that are widely available and anyone should have access to. I'm gonna start with a CBC, which might seem a little mundane, but I just wanna make a critical point about it. We have to really train ourselves to really look at the CBC. It's not just the hemoglobin, not just the white count. You wanna be very methodical and very thorough in the way you look at a CBC and differential. So this is a woman, this is an adult who I diagnosed just about a year ago. She had a history of a single pneumonia, um, and really the reason she came to me was that she had cervical papillomavirus that had required surgery. Now, this is a young woman. She's 20 years old, and this is the CBC that she brought with her. She came with this already. I'm just going to ask you to take a look at it. I want you to absorb those numbers, be methodical in the way you approach it. And I'm not going to ask for people to chime in with the chat room. I just want you to think about what you see that looks abnormal. I'll give you just a second. So when I looked at it, I said, oh, my goodness, those monocytes are really quite low. And the lymphocytes are kind of around the lower limit of normal. They're not technically abnormal, but certainly it's not a robust lymphocyte count. So she turned out to have GATA2 deficiency. So Again, the point I want to make, and I'll come back to GATA2 in a minute, is that you have to be very methodical. So 10 years ago, I never looked at a monocyte count. Couldn't have really told you what the normal range was. But we know it's a very sensitive sign of GATA2 deficiency, and so now I've trained myself to pay attention to the monocyte count. So thinking about other things where the CBC will help you, of course the neutrophil count will help you diagnose congenital neutropenias. It's going to be low in some other conditions, including most of the pigmentary dilution syndromes. It will be low in hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. You always wanna pay attention to the lymphocyte count, and here I wanna remind you that the normal ranges are hugely different between babies and adults. A baby should have a lymphocyte count over 3,000, an adult roughly over 1,000. So very important to know the changes with age. Most T-cell disorders will have a low lymphocyte count. Roughly 70% of the lymphocytes are T-cells. Most T-cell disorders have a quantitative decrement in T-cells, so makes sense. And then I'll just come back to the patient I presented. The absolute monocyte count is not low in every single GATA2 deficient patient, but it is low over time. It gets lower and lower with age. GATA2 deficiency, you're probably thinking, that's so rare, why should I worry about it? It's a lot more common than people think, and I think we miss it because it tends to present in adults, and it can present with malignancy, it can present with pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, it can look like a lot of different things, so it shows up in different specialist offices. So I just want to summarize the CBC and differential. I think there's a lot of information there, and you don't want to overlook any single part of it. <clears throat> Keeping with the theme of easy um, lab tests that are widely available, by all means, check your chemistries as well. As an immunologist, you're probably not that accustomed to paying attention to anything other than the, the sodium, the creatinine, and the liver function test. But this is a trick that Stephen Jollies in England has um, popularized. 
it was always something that some people did in a pinch, but he's really made it very valuable by demonstrating the way in which you can predict the IgG level based on a chemistry. So if you look at the left-hand side, the equation is written there. You take the total protein, subtract the albumin, and that gives you the calculated globulin. If you look at the graph on the right, what he's done is he's plotted the calculated globulin against the actual IgG level that he measured by nephilometry. You can see there's really good concordance. They really agree quite a bit. You lose a little bit at the lower end of the range, but generally these numbers are quite um, highly related to each other. So if you can't access antibody levels, if you can't get an IgG level, this is quite a reasonable substitute and should be available in any medical clinic or um, hospital. So I just want to bring up here that IPOPI has recently been very active in trying to make immunoglobulin levels a universally available lab. So you may know that the World Health Organization endorses a set of laboratory studies, not just for immune deficiencies, but across all different diagnoses that they think should be available in every country. So IPOPI has been very active in trying to get immunoglobulin levels listed as an essential lab test which I think is gonna be amazing. And why is this important? I'll just go back to those pie diagrams that I showed you. Antibody deficiencies are by far the most common category of immunodeficiency. And importantly, they are treatable. So unlike some conditions where you could make the diagnosis, but there's not necessarily a treatment, these are treatable. And again, IPOPI is advocating for having immunoglobulins listed as an essential medicine. So these are big strategic changes that I think will affect a lot of patients in developing countries. So let me turn now to probably the most typical thing that shows up in any immunology clinic, an adult with recurrent sinopulmonary infections. So I've listed HIV at the top. I know that in some countries it's just not an issue, but in the United States it is. So I listed HIV, but certainly the thing that we always wanna pay attention to is immunoglobulin levels and responses to vaccines. So the responses to vaccines are a measure of function. If you have it available, I would also suggest pneumococcal titers and an IgG level. And I'll explain why. What I've done is I've sort of appended the diagnoses here. I will say HIV rarely presents with sinopulmonary infections, but if you're in a country where there's a high rate of HIV, it does happen. It's worth testing an adult. So the immunoglobulin levels and the diphtheria and tetanus titers are what's required to diagnose common variable immunodeficiency, probably the single most common diagnosis in adults. The definition you'll remember, and I know I hope he sponsored a webinar on common variable recently, the definition, remember, is a low IgG plus a low IgM or IgA, and then a demonstrated poor response to vaccines. So it's a pretty clear definition, not always in real life, but the definition is pretty clear. The reason I added pneumococcal titers and an IgE level are to test for hyper-IgE syndrome and specific antibody deficiency. <coughs> Excuse me. Speaking of sinopulmonary infections, <clears throat> so I just wanted to um, add some cautions to interpreting. So if you're going to measure vaccine responses, the patient has to be vaccinated and has to be vaccinated within the time frame that that vaccine lasts for. So the, um, the pneumococcal vaccine for adults typically lasts 10 years. You wouldn't want to test those titers if it's been 20 years since they've had a vaccine. You would want to re-vaccinate them. And then remember for hyper-IgE syndrome, the IgE levels are usually quite high in childhood, so 8,000 to 30,000, really impressively high. But in adults, they can be a little bit lower. They can be 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, so a lot less impressive. So remember the other features. You can have delayed shedding of primary teeth. On the lower left here, I'm showing you the typical honeycomb picture of pneumatoceles. But over on the right, sometimes it's a single pneumatoceles and you have to um, alert your pulmonologist that that can be a feature of hyper-IgE syndrome. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Well, would you ever need more? So immunoglobulin levels in the setting of suspected common variable. This is a really thorny problem and one that is going to be very different five years from now than right now today. So since you had the common variable webinar not long ago, I'll just remind you that patients with common variable usually fall into two categories. One category has infections and does well with immunoglobulins, maybe a little antibiotic here and there. And it's the other category that's a problem. These folks have autoimmune disease, they can have hepatosplenomegaly. They have a much shorter lifespan and definitely need more attention and have more struggles. The reason I bring this up is there are validated biomarkers that segregate with the complex common variable patient population. And so you could argue that in addition to getting immunoglobulin levels and titers, that it would be important to get flow cytometry. Most of these biomarkers are flow cytometry so that you can partition the patients into one subset or another. And I sort of agree with that, but here's the problem. Knowing on day one, on the day of diagnosis, whether someone is in the infection only basket or the complex common variable basket, we don't know how to prevent all of those complications from happening. So it doesn't help you manage the patient better, although maybe it helps you monitor them better. Similarly, although you will see papers where people are now starting to do whole exome sequencing for patients with common variable immunodeficiency, it's a very rare time that you would act on that information, that it would change your management. I think that's going to be different in five years. I think bone marrow transplant for some genotypes will be offered, but I'm not sure how we are going to incorporate all of the pieces of information to help manage patients in the optimal way. So as of right now today, I think the biomarkers are useful for thinking about the patient, but they do not change management in the moment. So let's look at a child with recurrent sinopulmonary infections, and I'll just say this is not HIV. So if they're older, I treat them like adults. So I get a CBC and differential to check their lymphocyte count. I get immunoglobulins and titers the same as I would for an adult. What's different is in the younger children. So in the younger children, I think it's much harder to tell, is this infection a virus? Is it a bacterial infection? Was it a virus to start? And now it's a bacterial infection. So for the littler kids, I am a little more aggressive in my workup. And in addition to immunoglobulins and titers, I get T cell flow cytometry and a neutrophil count. So, and that's largely just my fear of missing someone with a combined immunodeficiency. So when I say T cell flow cytometry, probably in each of your hospitals, in each of your clinics, that's interpreted a different way and that's fine. There are lots of different ways, lots of different markers to run for flow cytometry. What I would say is essential is CD3, CD4, and CD8. So those are the T cell markers, CD19 or CD20 as a B cell marker, and some set of markers for natural killer cells. I think it's useful to be able to enumerate all of the major lymphocyte subsets. So I would say that is quite routinely part of almost all flow cytometry panels. Sometimes you'll get just CD3, CD4, and CD8 um, particularly in countries that have a lot of HIV. I don't really feel that that's adequate, particularly for children. Now you'll notice at the bottom that I highlighted a set of markers in blue. This is CD40, CD4, CD45, RA. These are markers that are designed to detect naive T cells. And the reason I include those is in the United States, we have newborn screening for skid. When you see a newborn with low T cells, if the T cells are all naive, you are more comfortable waiting and seeing if the T cells will come up than if the very first time you see the patient, however many T cells they have, they're all memory T cells. So when a baby is born, all the T cells should be naive. And then as we age, we get more and more memory. So between um, the ages of 15 and 30, you should be about half and half. You never get to 100% memory. So I would say, the CD4, CD4, CD45RA is important for little kids. 
So flow cytometry is also important in these settings, fungal infections, pneumocystis, viral infections. Um, if someone has BCG, I think it's important. So do, um, do be aware that looking at T cells and also ruling out chronic granulomatous disease by doing a, a dihydrobrotamine is also very useful in a range of settings. And I've just said that here, just as a reminder, there are lots of settings where knowing that the T cells are okay would be quite useful. So I'm gonna do a case and then I'll give you some resources. This is a three-year-old girl with allergies and eczema. I wanted to highlight some of the more atypical presentations, not just infections. She had really quite severe eczema and had some recurrent skin infections. She had had two pneumonias, but in the setting of asthma, it was hard to know. Um, but she was admitted for chronic diarrhea due to cryptosporidia, and she'd had this for three months and had some weight loss. So we started with the CBC and differential. So I'll give you a second to take a look at this and see if you see anything that worries you. Just a second to take a quick look. We then did some other immunologic evaluations that you see at the bottom of the slide. And again, I'll give you just a second to take a look at these and see if you can notice what is uh, atypical or unusual in her laboratory analysis. So this is what I picked out. I picked out a low lymphocyte count shown in the upper right, quite a high IgE, and low T cells shown in the bottom right there. Now those low T cells were a big clue for me, and notice that in someone with low T cells, you have a low lymphocyte count, just as we talked about. So she turned out to have DOC8 deficiency. This is the autosomal recessive type of hyper IgE syndrome. It has much more of a T cell component. I actually think it's a misnomer to say that it's hyper IgE syndrome. In her case, we confirmed the diagnosis by sequencing. And unfortunately, she had a very sad outcome. We weren't able to stabilize her enough to go to transplant. So let's use this case to talk a little bit about sequencing. When do I need sequencing? So this is a list of some conditions I put together where I think my approach is that there are three categories. There are conditions where it's nice to get sequencing, but not essential for my management in the here and now. It's not gonna change what I do right now today. I think for combined immunodeficiency shown in green, I always like to get it. Some of those have a very distinct natural history and it might change how you approach the patient. And then there are some categories in orange where I think sequencing is always necessary to make a diagnosis. And it makes a difference because some of these are autosomal dominant and they can be passed on to their children. But there are other issues to balance here, right? If there's someone who desires family planning, then probably you would be more likely to do sequencing than if they said, no, I'm never having more kids. And I just wanna remind you that every excellent disease has an autosomal phenocopy. So don't assume just because it's a boy with no B cells and no antibodies that it's excellent A gamma globulinemia. There are five different autosomal recessive disorders that look just like it. So you can't assume you know the inheritance unless you have a big pedigree or you know the sequencing. Now, I do think that sequencing will be more available and less expensive over time. And I just wanna um, distinguish between whole exome and whole genome in case that nomenclature is not familiar to you. Whole exome refers to sequencing that focuses on the parts of the gene that encode protein. There are lots of advantages to whole exome sequencing. It's more available than any other type of sequencing and it's becoming more automated, so it will grow in availability. But it misses things. So we know it's flawed, we accept that it's flawed, it's just what we can do right now. Whole genome sequencing sequences every part of the genome, but the analysis is so rudimentary right now that we know it also misses things. So it's very hard to get whole genome sequencing right now, and I don't know what the future holds for that. I presume it will be more available and more easily analyzed, but I hate to predict the future. So that brings us to my few last slides where I'm gonna talk about some resources. So I did wanna leave you with something. As I said, we all get stuck. We know the patient has something, we can't quite name it. So let me share with you some resources that I think will be valuable.
So Troy Torgerson has a classification scheme that is really useful. If you look in the gray boxes, these are the entry level tests that I talked about today, a CBC and differential antibody levels. And he just has such a nice layout, a nice way of thinking about the categorization. If you flip the page over, it's got some more advanced testing and a few little pearls that are useful. So this is um, the thing that I give to residents when they come to my clinic, when I'm trying to teach general pediatricians. I think it's useful in that way and it's a good reminder about the, um, the testing. Um, Quad AI has a very complex practice parameter uh, it's about 24 pages long, so it's not useful every day. But what I love about it is it actually replicates the thinking process. You sort of are putting together different patterns and trying to make a case for a particular diagnosis. So I love it because I think it's worth reading once just to see how they tried to replicate our thinking. And then this is an online algorithm that a colleague of mine put together, Soma Joyanucci. It's a little hard to read probably, but you can pick any feature from your patient. Maybe they have diabetes, maybe they had a fungal pneumonia, whatever features you think are most important. And then you click on the button, it takes you to a list of potential diagnoses, a little capsule about each disease, and some lab tests where you can get the testing done. So quite useful and beautifully laid out. The aesthetics are really nice. It's very, very intuitive. And then uh, lastly, I just gave you a bit of a laundry list here. The Immune Deficiency Foundation has the Consulting Immunologist Program. I listed the URL for that right below. It, anyone can access it. You just go in, you, t you give three sentences about your patient, and one of about 12 consulting immunologists will give you an answer. There's the clinical immunology listserv. You do have to be a member, but you can post cases and get as many as 30 people responding. The immunodeficiencysearch.com that I just told you about. And then there are two cell phone apps that I list on this page. And these are a listing of all the immunodeficiencies with a little bit of information about phenotype, not so much about testing. So I hope those are useful to you. They're things that I think in various settings can be enormously, um, enormously supportive of all the hard work that we do. So I'm going to end there and Martine is going to come back and take over. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sullivan for this wonderful talk. And uh, I think it's really useful. We get a lot of questions and maybe I will have one or two because we are running out of time. Um, one uh, which got a lot of success is the, the following. In countries where there are very few diagnostic tools available, how should doctors proceed with a suspected case of PID? It's a tricky question, but in a developing country, it, it happens very often. Yes, and I recognize I have taught in Eastern Europe and in Russia and in Africa as well. I know that lab testing is really a limiting aspect in terms of managing immunology patients. But I would say the tools I gave you at the beginning, looking at the CBC and differential and using the calculated globulin, almost every hospital I've been to, even in very rural areas, has had access to something like a metabolic panel. And that will at least let you know if the patient has much IgG. So I, I listed those as tools because I recognize that people have access to different levels of testing. Okay, and uh, in the same country, I would say, is it possible to diagnose PID using a test for HIV that may be of easier access in some developing countries? What do you think? So not the antibody test, which is the piece that's more widely available, the ELISA for HIV, but many countries that have a high rate of HIV do offer limited flow cytometry with CD3 and CD4. And so that's at least a start to looking for T cell defects. Okay. And something uh, a bit different, are there cheaper alternatives to the TREC assay to screen for kids uh, like TMS? And if so, what are the pros and cons? So the, the truck assay is actually very inexpensive. Now, um, I realize that companies might charge a lot for it, but to set it up in country, it's incredibly inexpensive. It's less than a dollar per assay. So it's actually incredibly cost effective as a newborn screen when you set it up to scale. 
Having said that, in countries that don't offer it that way, if you're paying a company to run it, it can be quite expensive. And really the alternative is to do flow cytometry, which is also a little bit expensive. Okay, so now we come to the end of the webinar and uh, maybe some key messages out of this. Warning signs, clinical features, usual age of onset are key to suspect the PID. First one, the second one would be maybe look closely at the test results, as you said, use the information and resources that are already available and thank you for giving a lot. Sequencing is not always necessary, even if it will be more available over time and consult colleagues when in doubt. That would be our messages. A big thank you to you, uh, Dr. Sullivan, for this very fantastic talk and for all the answers you provided. We had many questions from the audience. Some of them got written answers by Dr. Malawi. Thank you, Dr. Malawi, for this. Thanks again to all of you for attending IPOPI webinar. Please note that you will be able to see the recording on IPOPI TV within a couple of days. Don't hesitate to share it uh, as much as you can. And many thanks again to Dr. Sullivan and to CSR Bering, and hope to see you in the upcoming IPOP webinars. I just had to, have to add that we will come back to you with written answers to the question we didn't address because of lack of time and you had too many, which is absolutely fantastic. Thank you to all. <laughs>